telling the story for 60 years. For 60 years, it has been the theme of Ian's life to tell the story. This he has sought to do primarily through his ministry, but also through exhaustive use of all the talents God has given him. Converted to Christ as a boy of six years of age, preaching his first sermon, albeit a very brief one, at the age of 16, ordained into the ministry at 20, founding the Free Presbyterian Church at 25, marrying me when he was 30, imprisoned at 40, and again at 42, awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity at 40, elected to public office for the first time at 44, and many times since, leader of the opposition at 45, entering the European Parliament at 53, becoming leader of the largest party in Northern Ireland at 79, a free man of Ballymoney at 74, a free man of Ballymena at 78, made a privy councillor at 79, marking 60 years of ministry at 80 and in the interim living out the daily responsibilities of each of these roles not to mention writing and editing being a devoted father and grandfather and the best husband, companion and friend I could wish for However, there is one date not included in the above, which Ian would point to as being the pivotal date of his life and ministry, and which resulted in the road that his life has taken. In the small prayer room of what was then the Ravenhill Evangelical Mission Church, Ian and three other men met for prayer. John Douglas, who incidentally was the first young man saved through Ian's ministry, Bob Scott and Jim Welsh met at Ian's invitation for a special time of prayer. As Ian describes it, they met in the dark and went home in the dark because that meeting began on the Friday night and continued right through until the Saturday night. God graciously met with these men and extraordinary blessing has flowed through our province as a result. In the darkest times, through the mundane commonplace days and in the bright summer times which also come, the work wrought through that time of prayer has been the anchor. That is why we can say of these 60 years, to God be the glory. One aspect of Ian's ministry is his concern for missions. This compassion has infiltrated the ethos not only of his own congregation, but also that of the Free Presbyterian Church. A generous and practical support of missionaries and missionary projects is typical of his warm-hearted zeal for those in such work. Often he will say that a church which is not gracious to and concerned for missions will be a stagnating church. 
Meanness to missions leads to an impoverished church. As often as has been possible, he has visited foreign fields to encourage and stand alongside those laborers. When this is not possible, he goes the second mile here and rallies prayer, financial support, and encourages others to help where they can. Standing alongside is a vital part of his ministry. Ian is often asked to sign autographs. Those of you who may possess one will know that he always follows his name with the text Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. Ian is a Protestant. He never has to explain this to anyone. He is a Protestant of the Reformed faith. He has instilled into his ministry at every opportunity the importance of the Reformation, the history of the martyrs, the price paid by those who went before to ensure our religious freedoms. His Oxford Union debate is still referred to even today. Daring to hold up the Roman wafer and calling idolatry for what it is, is no easy task. When, as a member of the European Parliament, he was denied his right to speak in the House against the Pope's visit, he chose to express his views by way of protest. Thank God for grace given for such a task. It is a well-documented protest from a press point of view. What is not so widely known is that this protest was instrumental in encouraging those who still feel Rome's oppression and it was used to lead others to Jesus Christ. The man most outraged by AIDS protest was the Austrian member von Habsburg of the old Habsburg family. Yes, the very family known throughout history as the Pope's defenders. Some things never change. In Westminster, he was suspended from the chamber for refusing to take back his charge that the then Secretary of State, Mayhew, was not telling the truth regarding his talks with the Irish Republican Army. Before the week was out, it was clear that talks had indeed taken place. Calling a lie a lie, refusing to bow to pressure to do otherwise, was shied away from by others that day. However, God used that event to uplift the truth and we received hundreds of responses from friends and foes alike, expressing gratitude for the truth having been spoken. Ian's imprisonments and those of his colleagues, of course, were the most difficult times to live through, both from the family circles involved and the church's point of view. Yet even in such a part of the journey, the all-sufficient one enabled Ian, the families and the church to learn the truth of the words that he faileth not. These 60 years have flown in. As we mark this milestone in Ian's ministry, in that of our own congregation and in that of the church as a whole, we thank God with full hearts for Ian's readiness to bow his will to that of his redeemers and for being prepared to run the race, not according to his plan, nor at his own pace, but according to that of his Saviour. The race is still continuing and the pace must be maintained. In recent months we have rejoiced in the healing granted to him and we believe that the best is yet to be.
As our church embarks on this new era, there could be no better theme than that of the hymn which is Ian's favourite. There is a story sweet to hear. I love to tell it to It fills my heart with hope and cheer. Tis old, yet ever new.